10 elements of a high converting landing page. For sales in business, we need leads. That's sort of just the general process that the way things flow. In order to generate sales, we first need leads. We need customers or prospects that are interested in what we have to offer. To generate leads, we need a way to be able to capture them. So there are a variety of different ways, but one of the most common, particularly in digital marketing, is the landing page. It's very simple, it's very common in terms of ways to generate leads, and basically all we're talking about when we talk about a lead capture page or a landing page is basically, you might have actually heard this called a squeeze page, a landing page, a lead capture page. They're all interchangeable, they all basically mean the same thing. The idea is it's a simple one page website or web page that basically has an option for somebody to sign up and usually with a promise of either a free gift or a free guide or something they're gonna get in exchange for their email. You know, in the old days you could sort of put one up and if you had anything to value of value to offer at all, people would sign up. They weren't inundated with emails yet they weren't jaded about the idea that they're gonna get marketed to, so it was very easy. It's become more and more complex and more difficult because people are a little bit more closely guarded with their email addresses because of the fact that they know they're going to get a lot of email after. So we have to be clever about what we're offering. It has to align with what they really want, and it has to be something of value that is going to be worth them giving their name and email address. So. If we want to generate leads, the smart thing to do is to create a great landing page that converts visitors to subscribers. Once we have that, there are a variety of different ways we can drive traffic to it, we can advertise it, we can use SEO, but the key is it has to convert the visitors to subscribers. All the traffic in the world is going to be useless if when people hit the page, they click off and they don't want to sign up. So what we want to do is we want to find a, an opt-in rate or a sign-up rate that is high enough and we want to continually test and, and optimize until we hit that. So just as a general rule of thumb, and this is going to vary quite a bit by industry, but you want to consider getting at least 20%. If 20% of the people aren't opting in when they hit the page, again, it's going to depend on your niche, so you can't sort of take that as law, it's just a general idea. I've seen great landing pages do 30, 40, 50, even you know 50% or more of an opt-in or, or sign-up rate. That's more rare these days than it was back then, but that's okay, it can still be done. However, in general, anything below 10% is going to be, you're gonna struggle in order to be able to convert that into enough sales unless you have a really high ticket offer. So we wanna to try to shoot somewhere in that 20 to 30% range as, as a decent sort of goal post, and then we always wanna be improving it. So. It's important to include all the right components in order to be able to make this happen and to maximize the signups. So the question becomes, what do we do to create that landing page? What does it look like? What elements does it need to include? And how do we maximize the signups we're going to get? Well, to create an effective landing page for our sales funnel, we wanna follow these important key steps. The first thing, and this may be something you've already done, but if it isn't, it is really important. Sometimes people skip over this step and figure, well, if I just throw together a page it, with an offer of some sort, it's gonna be fine. But the first step is actually to define your target audience. We have to understand who it is that we're actually trying to attract. We want our ideal customers. Um, you know, I was actually on a, a, a podcast interview the other day, and I was talking to somebody whose specialty is lead generation. And one of the things that he said, and, and traffic generation from social media, and I brought up the, the concept of things going viral. And he said, actually, if you have a specific business with a specific product, you actually don't want things to go viral because you're going to attract a bunch of people who aren't in your target audience. It's gonna spread to all these other people, and then you need to weed through them to find where your real customers are. You're better off to have lesser of a result, but a result that is congruent with what you're going to be offering and with the customers you really want. So that starts by understanding who our ideal customer is 
And that goes beyond just sort of their demographics. It's about their needs, their pain points, or their motivations, because that's going to come into play in these next steps. Once we have clarity on who it is that we're trying to attract, the next thing we need to do is craft a clear and compelling value proposition. So what is it that we could offer them that's going to make them want to sign up? You know, we might be a really nice guy, really nice gal, whatever. That isn't going to get people to sign up if they don't know who we are. You know, if you have name recognition, if you're a celebrity, you put up a lead capture page, people will sign up just because they want to know more about you or be closer to you or whatever. If you're an anonymous person like I am or most other people are, then we're going to need to offer something that intrinsically in and of itself has enough value that they're going to want to give us their name and email and let us market to them and communicate with them again and again. So we need to think about what it is they want, what their needs are, what their desires are, what their fears are, what their goals are. Understand that. Understand what we have to offer that fits into that. And then communicate the benefits and the value of our product or service and highlight how it's going to solve the problem or meet the need for that audience. When we're able to do that, we've got their interest. When we're able to get them to see there's value here, they we're, we're creating a compelling reason for them to want to give their email address because it's worth it. The benefit they're going to get is worth the cost of putting in a name and an email address. The third step that we need to follow or the third element we need is a strong headline. Now, a headline is absolutely critical and it's deceptive because headlines are short. They're generally large font. So a lot of times people sort of rush through this step. They figure, well, you know, the headline is the headline, but I'm going to put all this value on the page and, you know, that's the stuff that really matters. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you mess up the headline, the rest of what you have doesn't even matter because no one will get past it. The headline has to grab people. It has to offer whatever the key benefit is, and it has to be a benefit that is something that matters to the person. You know, I was doing a copywriting course um, years and years ago. I was, I was listening to various headlines and how you craft headlines and body copy and all these other things and how to be persuasive. And I remember they were talking about, I don't remember if it was Gary Halbert, but it was one of the copywriting legends. And one of his clients was a, it was like hair club for men, or it was one of those hair loss um, companies. And, you know, his headline, the headline that he ultimately came up with is suffering from hair loss with a question mark. Think about how simple that is, but how deadly effective that really is. Because he said, you know, here's the thing. There's a lot of people that have hair loss, but if they don't care about it, I'm bald. I don't care. So if you try to pitch to me something about hair regrowth, I'm not interested because it doesn't bother me to be bald. But there are a lot of people out there, men and women, that if they're losing their hair, if they've lost their hair, it really bothers them. So how succinct can you get? I mean, that is a killer headline, suffering from hair loss. I mean, boom, you nailed it all. You've hit that pain point right on the head. Any single person that feels that way is going to be attracted to whatever you have to say next, and you're going to have their full attention. So we want to write a strong headline. It should be as simple, short, and concise as possible. We don't want to be too cheeky or clever with this. Sometimes people try to get overly clever with, with a headline or they try to do plays on words and stuff. That can work if it serves the purpose. But avoid cleverness and sort of, you know, jokes and all these other things unless it fits in exactly to what you're doing. The most important thing is that if I'm a prospect reading that headline, I see a big benefit that matters a lot to me that I'm going to get. Or I see you articulate a pain point I've got so clearly that you, I know you understand me. Those are the two kinds of headlines we really want to focus on. If you can work in some sort of creativity or cleverness or humor, great. If you can't, that's okay. Make sure it's got that element to it. We want to create a concise, attention-grabbing headline that accurately reflects the page's content. That's the other thing. We want to make sure it's congruent. We don't want to do something to trick people to watch, and then they're going to get angry when they see that it was sort of a bait and switch. And we want to include the relevant keywords if possible, because those are things that not only latch on 
to the person and what they care about, but also will be relevant for SEO and free search engine traffic. The fourth thing we want to do is use high quality visuals. A landing page that's all text is going to struggle because we're visual and we scan. So the headline is critical and so is the aesthetic of the page. It has to have an arresting visual or a, a video or something that's multimedia that's going to draw us in. And then the text can all support that. But we want to make sure we grab them with the headline, we keep them with the imagery and the visuals, and then we bring them in to the story with the text and the rest of it. So we can incorporate compelling images and graphics. And again, we want to make sure that they're relevant to the product or service. Just putting something on there that's shocking is not really going to be a great look. Right? That's not going to build the brand that we want to be proud of or that people are going to feel good about. They're going to feel like they were tricked into, into watching or listening or reading. So we want to make sure that the product or service illustrates its benefits. And a general rule of thumb here is when possible, if you know, stock imagery can be great. You, know, you can go to Pexels, you can go to Pixabay, whatever. You can download free, you know, stock, royalty-free stock images, use them. Some of them are wonderful. But if we can do something that gives sort of a juxtaposition where it's something different than what people would expect, you know, for an example, a flying pig, right, something like that, um, a farmer standing on a soccer field, these things that sort of arrest us because we, we don't associate them with each other. But again, only if we can do that in a way that's congruent with it making sense for what we're offering. If we can do that, it's very powerful. If we can't, we're better off to go with the stock image that's just going to illustrate what it is that we want to say. The fifth element, or the th fifth thing we want to do, is we want to include social proof. This is very powerful because social proof is the one thing that transcends our own marketing message. People in general are skeptical. People in general are jaded. They understand that we get something. We benefit if they sign up. And so when we tell them how great our product or service is, when we tell them all the ways they're gonna benefit, there's a little voice in the back of their head saying, yeah, sure, right, okay, I know you're gaining from this. There's a reason that when a neighbor or a friend says to you, this restaurant's fantastic, this movie is great, we, we're more inclined to take what they say at face value, not only because we have a relationship with them, but they're not getting a kickback. They're not getting a commission if we go to the restaurant. They don't get a check in the mail if we go to the movies. So they don't have anything to gain. So we have no reason to distrust what they're saying. When it's from a marketing company, we know they're going to gain something if we engage with it. So we're automatically skeptical. Social proof like customer testimonials, quotes we've got from customers, reviews of our products and services, you know, uh, any kind of videos or screenshots or images or headshots of people with what they had to say, build trust and credibility with potential leads and customers because they're seeing other people like them getting results. And when possible, what we want to do is we want to include a testimonial or a social proof element from each of the various main um, benefits for our product. So if we feel like there are three benefits our product offers, the number one biggest benefit that's the most powerful or the most universal is the one we want to focus on with the headline and everything else. We don't want to get confusing by trying to give too many benefits. But once we start to get into the meat of it, we want to include all of that. And the best way to do that with social proof is to have one person talking about this benefit, one person talking about that benefit, one person talking about this third benefit. So if it saves me time, it makes me money, whatever it is, makes me look better. I want one for each of those things because now no matter which bucket I fall into as a prospect and which benefit is most important to me, you've, you've got me because you've got somebody else saying they got the result that I want. And so now I'm going to trust it a little bit more and that's going to incentivize me to give you my email address or my cell phone number. The sixth thing, and this is vitally important, is to keep the design clean and simple. One of the mistakes I see with landing pages is people want to vomit all over the page every single benefit. They want to put down every, and they want to convince people by trying to overdo it and oversell it. 
That doesn't work for landing pages most often. Most often clean, uncluttered, usually if you can fit it on the screen in one page above the fold, that's best. If they have to scroll a little bit, that's okay, but it shouldn't be a page where they need to scroll and scroll and scroll. It should be very simple and it shouldn't be more than maybe two to three pages tall in terms of scrolling because we want this to be simple. All we want to do is generate enough curiosity. We're not trying to sell products. We're trying to generate enough curiosity, enough interest, and provide enough value that the person says, yes, this is worth my email. Once they've done that, now we've got an opportunity to market to them over and over again where we can make all these in-depth pitches, where we can send them to other pages. On a sales page where we're offering something we want money in return, we want to be more long form. We want to be more long-winded. But this, we want to focus on what the, what the goal of the page is. And it's really simple. It's to get every person that sees it to see that there's a value and to give us their name, email, and or cell phone number, whatever we want in terms of a lead from them. So that way we can later market to them and convert them to a customer. So we want a clean, uncluttered layout with a clear hierarchy of information with headings, subheadings that break up the content. We don't want long paragraphs, three, four sentences, maybe bullet, three, four sentences or headline, subheadline, you know, three, four uh, bullets or one, three sentence paragraph, subheadline, another one, subheadline, another one, boom, that's it, right? Keep it simple, keep it clear, keep it clean and make sure that our, you know, the place where they can sign up is always above the fold. We always want that to be on the page when they first land on it. We don't want them to scroll down to have to sign up for the, uh, for the free gift or the offer or subscription or whatever. The seventh thing we want to do is you want to craft a clear and prominent call to action. This is so important, but it's a step that, believe it or not, a lot of people miss. They put up a, a sign-up form. They put up a nice headline. They've got visuals, all this other stuff. And it's not abundantly clear what the person's supposed to do. We assume that they're going to figure out, well, hey, put your name and email in the, in the box and click the button. We want to have in a big button, you know, and a big headline, enter your name here with an arrow that blinks or whatever, right? Enter your email address here. Click the button. We want to state it out in clear terms with a big button because we don't want to leave anything to chance and we don't want anything to be hidden or hard to find. The more friction that exists between the person signing up and getting on our list, the fewer signups we're going to get. It's that simple. So we want to make sure that the call to action button or the link for it stand out and clearly communicate what the next step is. It might seem obvious, but they've done study after study after study and a big fat clear to action, clear call to action has been proven over and over and over again to increase results, improve conversions, improve signups. So we want to make sure we're very clear on the next step we want our visitors to take. The eighth thing we want to do is we want to ensure that the page is mobile responsive. It's something like almost 70% of people now first view a web page on their mobile phone. And so if we have a great landing page and we're all excited about it, and it's desktop version, and then we go to look at it on a cell phone, and the text is all broken, and the sign-up form is all skewed, and it's way off the page, and they got to scroll, you're going to lose 50% of the people that would sign up. Because believe it or not, in most cases, you're going to get more sign-ups from mobile visitors than you are from desktop visitors. So we could start with the desktop page, but we want to make sure that we view it on a mobile phone and that it looks as good and tight and clean on the mobile as it does on the desktop. So we want to readjust the headline fonts and most good software now, landing page software or funnel designers have an option for the mobile version and the desktop version where you could vary the font sizes and all these other kinds of things. So this isn't hard to do, but it's important to do. And we want to actually check it on our phone itself, not on the mobile preview on our web page builder. That's not always exactly how it looks. We want to make sure it looks good and that it has to load really fast is another key element. And this is why we want to keep the page simple. 
if it takes a few seconds for the page to load, it might not seem like much, you will lose a tons of your visitors, especially on mobile devices because we are impatient and we don't wanna wait. So if the page doesn't load almost instantly, they're gone. Design the landing page to work well on all devices, especially mobile. The ninth thing is we wanna optimize for search engines. And this also goes back to the speed issue. If our website loads slowly, search engines will ding you and they'll drop you in the rankings because as good as your page might be, people aren't gonna wait for it to load. You could go online, you could just Google website speed test and there are tons of free tools. You type in your URL, it'll tell you how fast it is and it will give you all the steps you could take to make it better. We want to include relevant keywords in our content, in our title too, if we're able to, or our headline. And we want to improve visibility in search results because that's going to generate additional free traffic. And the longer that page is up and the more traffic we drive to it, the more free traffic it will get. The 10th thing we want to do is we want to implement A-B testing. We want to create different versions of the page and we only change one element at a time. So if we're gonna change the headline, we keep the, the copied version of the page exactly the same, and we only change the headline. If we're gonna change the image, we only change the image, and everything else is the same. This way, when we send half the traffic to each of those, we could compare which version is doing better. And as we keep improving our overall testing, then we test a different variable, then a different variable, then a different variable. We could try different calls to action, different colors, different images, different headlines, different fonts. It doesn't matter. As long as we do one thing at a time with the goal to constantly get better and better. Sometimes our new version will be better than the old one, so we replace the old one. Other times our original version will be better. That's fine. We want to keep testing, keep optimizing, because for every couple percent additional we get for signups, it makes it that much more valuable. We can afford to drive more expensive traffic to it. We could spend more money on that because we could convert more sales and generate more revenue. And so it's vitally important that our front end lead engines are highly optimized and constantly being improved. Continuously test different elements of our landing page, improve its performance over time. So the key thing here is to remember that our landing page should be tailored to the specific stage of the funnel that it's targeting. We talked a lot on this particular episode about top of the funnel pages, where we're trying to build awareness and education. You can also do lead capture pages for bottom of funnel where it's more designed about sales. But for this purposes, we're really talking about that front end where somebody doesn't know us at all, or maybe they've seen our name, but they're not a current prospect and how to get them into our funnel to become a prospect so we're able to do that. If we follow these guidelines, we follow these 10 steps, and we continuously optimize our landing page, then we can create an effective tool for converting visitors into leads very, very easily. And it's something that we can scale up and drive more and more traffic to. So the takeaway here is that landing pages are an essential tool to generate leads for digital marketing. The good news is they're relatively quick and easy to create but that doesn't mean we should rush it. We need to understand the importance to our business in growing sales and be sure to include all of the important elements so we can convince visitors to sign up. By including these 10 elements, we're on the right track to being able to create lead magnets that will power our sales process and fuel our growth.